Good evening, and welcome to the second episode of The Power of Ten, Discussing Education's Future. This show is recorded live every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and rebroadcast on www.edhangout.com. My name is Brian Mannix, and I am your host. I'm a social studies teacher at Great Neck South Middle School and their technology staff developer. I've started the power of 10 because I have a thirst for change and I have a strong belief in the idea that we can do better. A belief that we are at a profound crossroads in both education and in society at large and we must seize this moment to ensure that we move passionately forward in a direction that will allow for the emotional and economic success of everyone on the planet. I alone cannot make a difference, but with the power of 10 individuals analyzing, creating, and sharing all of our most innovative ideas, we can truly change the world. With that small goal in mind, I would like to introduce the topic for tonight's show. Politics and education. Republicans, Democrats, school budgets, unions, and how we can best serve our students by navigating through this difficult system. I hope you will join us every Wednesday at 8 and uh, check out the show in Google Hangouts live by searching Brian Maddox or uh, by watching the show on edhangout.com. And you can always email me with questions or show, show suggestions at mannixlab, M-A-N-N-I-X-L-A-B at gmail.com. Thanks. Hope you enjoy the show. How you doing? So, doing okay, but I'm Trying to finish up the uh, the work day. I'm in Los Angeles, so it's it's okay. a quarter after five. Let me just turn off my fan here. I can't hear as well. Okay. So it's quarter so after right five. Huh? What do you do? What do you do? Um, right now I'm I'm focusing on turning around an education news site. Okay. Um, it's uh, one that's been around for a long, long time, like since '97. So. Uh, Quite a while, about seven lifetimes, you know, in the internet age. So, uh, back in the day, it was in the same conversation as uh, Chronicle of Higher Ed and Education Week, and uh, was slowly, you know, it slowly became kind of a ramshackle property. Yeah, uh, and I've just been uh, hired to turn the thing around. So, I'm as we work up the relaunch, which is in a few weeks, I'm trying to do as much as I can to. Uh, talk with all different types of people in the ed community uh, about uh, lots of different issues. Uh, talking with the tech people about how they think ed tech is covered in the education media. Um, you know, is it good? Is it bad? Uh, too broad? Too narrow? Uh, all sorts of different things. So, you know, I'm kind of in uh, uh, listening and questioning mode at this point to find out what's what can be useful for people? Because I can think about it all day long. You know? sure. And it, it just, it's never, well, never going to be as good as talking to a ton. Um, you know, it's just way more useful to, to talk to everybody and, uh, uh, you know, just really hear from them. Absolutely. So what about you? Uh, not much. This is the second go around. Um, I am just basically on summer vacation. I was actually just out east. I live on Long Island. Uh, I teach for uh, a school, middle school in uh, in Great Neck in New York. Okay, and, I was in Cooperstown originally. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and I just went out east, and I I barely made it back for the show. And uh, so I'm kind of uh, a little disheartened because last week it went very very well. We had like. 10 people the whole time we had people waiting to get in and uh and then unfortunately the the my recording like blew up at the end of the show so i there was some error on google hangout and i got booted off and i lost the recording so i was hoping this week would be better um but i wanted to the topic for tonight i mean obviously we can have anything if it's you know if it's just you and i and a couple of people um i was hoping to talk about politics and education and how potential spending cuts in the budget uh, is going to affect, you know, our future and what, what we can, how we can make do with what we've got, and you know how we can act. 
Yeah, that, uh, that's one thing that drew me in because I, uh, I used to write a lot about that. I actually stopped about a year and a half ago because uh, I was getting uh, a lot of clients for media and communication stuff where, um, where I thought uh, I just want to keep all of my personal opinions separate. I don't want it to reflect on any clients in any way. Right. So, you know, I really held off on that, which means when I see, uh, uh, you know, a little bit of bait like you've put up, <laughs> I get excited. <laughs> right. So, right. Uh, yeah, but it, uh, there's a whole lot to talk about there, isn't there? Yeah. It's, uh, it's a scary situation. I mean, you know, it's, it's interesting that, you know, I've always wondered why public education is the one area where voters get to vote specifically on the budgets. Um, you know, you don't get to vote on the federal budget. You don't get to vote directly on your state budget. Right. We we vote for representatives, you know, in New York to to take care of uh, of the uh, of the of the budget. But yet at the same time, we get to vote yes or no on uh, you know on, on whether to give it a thumbs up or thumbs down. It just it seems crazy to me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I just had uh, my girlfriend just came home. It's okay. Um, well, I think that's part of, part of the uh, the local funding component. Uh, you know, just because so much of the budget comes from local taxes. You know, if, if uh, that wasn't it, you know, I don't think it would be as much of an issue. Yeah, I don't know. It's just interesting. We uh, where I live, there's a this this sort of a big big deal happening. Uh, LIPA, uh, like uh, Keyspan and National Grid or whatever. Uh, the LIPA place in Long Island, which is right by us in Glenhead, I'm in Seacliff, uh, is shutting down. So there's about $22 million uh, that they normally give the school district that is no longer going to be there. And there's a 2% cap in New York on what, what you can raise your, you know, your taxes by, your school taxes. So I don't know what on earth they're going to do, if they're going to get some sort of special exemption. Uh, how are they going to fill that's, that gap? That's likely, I think, uh, because that's a, a pretty unique case, too. Um, you know, most uh, most of the communities, uh, you know, don't haven't had a massive uh, reduction in funding like that. Right. Uh, so, I, you know, and there are other places that love the 2% tax cap. Uh, I uh, certainly supported it myself, um, knowing of so many people who... Uh, have either moved or are seriously considering moving because, you know, they're being taxed out of, of their neighborhoods. Right. Uh, I know of one woman who uh, was uh, a school board member herself, uh, was a university professor years ago, um, and uh, she's just uh, uh, retired on a fixed income and lives uh, right in Cooperstown. And she has for, I'd say, the last four years, uh, she's been kind of making a decision every single year to give it one more year mm -hmm. because the taxes are so high that it's just not a, a workable uh, situation. So uh, that 2% cap, whereas I understand it creates some problems, uh, it helps a whole lot of people out too. Oh, definitely. Definitely people on fixed incomes, there's no question. Um, and people yeah. in Westchester, Irvington, around there, uh, they've got a lot to complain about when it right. comes to property taxes. Yeah, no question. No question. So, so tell me more about the uh, the newspaper that you're working on. It's actually here. I'll pop you a link in in the chat here. Okay. Um, what uh, what you see right now is not what you're going to get in a few weeks. Okay. Um, uh, this was uh, a site where the ownership changed uh, several times in the last few years, and it finally is stable and committed. They've uh, committed lots of resources to totally transforming it, which means uh, making it so it doesn't look like it's straight out of 2004. Mm -hmm. um, changing the organization, uh, focusing on ed issues, as opposed to some of the fringe political stuff that's on there. Uh, but unfortunately, we can't make all those layouts uh, and content changes until we're done with the design. Right. So, you know, we're on hold for a couple of weeks, and, uh, you know, then we're going to relaunch, and uh, I have about uh, 35 or 40 uh, new contributors lined up from just all over the map. Some people who are working on charters, and some who are 
working on teaching and parenting issues and just, you know, everything that's relevant. So it's a pretty exciting, uh, pretty exciting opportunity. That's great. And what, and what is your role within uh, Education News? I, I was hired to be the editor and run the turnaround. So, right. uh, you know, everything uh, at this point, uh, the site owners aren't edu- education people. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they've, you know, they've handed it off to me uh, to handle it. Uh, and it. It's nice in a way that they aren't because they aren't biased in any way. Right. They, you know, they're not pushing for coverage on A and, you know, ignore B. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it also means that I have a lot of explaining to do hmm. frequently. Right. Uh, by, you know, I have to make them understand why something is important, for example. Sure, your editorial choices. And that's been useful. Yeah, that's been useful, though, because isn't that the name of the game? You know, yeah. Getting people to understand it. And I have to think about it all the time. And, you know, how are these folks who have no hands in the education uh, bag, how are they going to get a lot out of it? So, you know, it's really healthy approach. Right. You know, I'd, I'd like to ask you about something that I just found a link to... Uh, I got to go back and find it. it. Was it was put on my Google, uh, you know, Google Plus post somewhere um, about uh, interactive textbooks and okay. just changing the uh, just the entire concept of a textbook and what it's all about. And I I had posted a link for myself on uh, WeCollaborate.com where they're having a, with Steve Hargan on. They're having a uh, a contest to try to win like the Illuminate platform for fifty educators or whatever. I saw that. Yeah. Did you see that? And uh, I, I put up a post on there basically trying to change the way we do textbooks um, and make them more student-centered, make them based on learning, uh, learning styles, interactive, and making them so that they're, com- they're completely fluid and dynamic and that they're, they're a platform such as that you're not just reading, they're not just online digital information, but they're like what we're doing now where yeah. people all across the country, students, can interact and, and work on group projects together um, from different parts of the country. Someone sent me a link based off that post that I put on uh, Google+, Plus to somebody. I just read half the article about a half hour ago, and uh, it was exactly what, what I was talking about, and they made the comparison, which I've made myself, uh, to Pandora. That if we can create the musical genome, you know the Pandora, the, the yeah. yeah. If we can create the musical genome of somebody from you know a bunch of songs or a bunch of albums or a bunch of seed artists, isn't it possible for us to create you know? And they called it a learning genome for each sure. individual person by using software and by using um, by using textbooks. And I thought I thought it was a brilliant, you know, it was. I I, I guess I thought it was a brilliant idea because it's very similar That's to my own. Interesting comparison uh, with Pandora. I, I haven't um, I haven't come across that before, and it, uh, that makes a lot of sense because I think a lot of people are familiar with how uh, things like Pandora work. Mm-hmm. Uh, and just just saying, hey, why don't you think about it in the context of textbooks? You know, all of a sudden it gets kind of interesting. Fast. Right. It's a it's a great mashup. You know. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I mean, now the, the practical reality and the business reality of that. That's a separate discussion. Right. Um, but the theory side, pretty cool. <laughs> Definitely. So what, what is your take on uh, where we are politically uh, in terms of, uh, let's, I guess, start with the Obama administration and just what, what how, where have we come or, and where are we going from since Ch- uh, No Child Left Behind? Uh, do you feel good about it? Do you feel bad about it? Do you think uh, we're, we're heading in the right direction or do you think it's more of the same? Well, what I'm what I'm real pleased about is that uh, is that a lot of assumptions about about organizations like unions are being questioned. Mm-hmm. Um, everybody knows that that any type of organization, whether it's a school or a business or anything like that, anything big enough, has to be self-critical, and it has to uh, kind of police itself as well. Uh, if you're going to ensure quality, you constantly have to have to look at yourself, and that's one thing that uh, that the unions have not done a terribly good job of over the last uh, probably 30 years. Yeah. And so, as painful as it might be uh, for you know the state unions, or uh, you know, I'm thinking 
in terms of uh, NISUC, um, as tough as it is for them, it's about time. Uh, and I think uh, that's a great step uh, rather than, than uh, you know, letting, letting them stomp on everybody. Uh -huh. um, so what, what do you think about... What do you think about the changes in New York is a great step? Like, what, 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 what are the highlights for you that you say, wow, that's a great new program, that's something that will hold teachers accountable? Or what, you know, what, what do you feel good about in terms of the movement in New York? In New York, not as much as I'd like. Okay. Um, I still think, uh, I'm trying to think of specifics. Um, Here's an example. Out in Buffalo, there's a group called uh, Buffalo Reform Ed. And are you familiar with the parent figure uh, in Los Angeles? No. In Compton? No. Nope. Okay, it's uh, a law in California that was first applied here in Compton. Uh, well, I'm not in Compton, but here in L.A., mm -hmm. um, where if 50% of parents in a school decide that the school needs to change, then uh, you know 50% or more sign a petition then it can become a charter, you can have total staff turnover. There are four different options, but right. they're all drastic. That's great. Uh, so this is a big deal yeah. you know, to, to give parents the power to, to do that. that I, um, I'm all for that. Well, there's a group out in Buffalo that is uh, trying to do it. Uh, they brought it to the, the state assembly. Um, they were unsuccessful. You know, the, the legislative session a couple weeks ago when it ended. That thing was a mess. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of stuff just, going on at the end. Yeah, and then in the last few days, everything shut down so they could focus on uh, the gay marriage uh, mm -hmm. debate. Right. Yeah. And one of the things that got lost was was this group's uh, bill about having uh, this parent trigger, as it's called, uh, available to schools in New York. And, you know, they failed. Are they going to, uh, you know, win anytime soon? I don't know, but I do know that they wouldn't have gotten this far even five years ago. Mm -hmm. So the climate has has really changed in New York, where uh, they were able to put pretty strong uh, ed reform community uh, together and bring a serious bill to Albany. Um, do, do you know the name of the bill? You, you mentioned the name of the group. Do you do you know the? Uh... The name of the bill, or the uh, the name of the uh, yep. you know. To link you here, uh, I've spoken with with some of the people there in the last few weeks, and it's a tiny little outfit, with just a few people in a you know, limited office space with a few resources. Uh, but they're doing a great job. They've gotten a lot of national attention. Mm -hmm. They're, uh, I'd say, they're similar to Democrats for Education Reform. Uh -huh. uh, you know, they're kind of on the, the left of center camp, right. which makes them a little different from, the, you know, the KIPP types in New York or the Brighter Choice people in Albany. Right. Uh, uh, so it's, it's interesting to see that contrast uh, in New York, but uh, they're definitely worth paying attention to. Hmm. What do you think about, uh, you know, I guess what I see in New York and, and around the country is, is this is the is the notion well well good on the one hand but uh, i think i'm fearful of it on the other uh is accountability accountability is great right uh, teachers need to be sure. accountable accountable and i agree with you 100 percent that the unions have not done a great job of keeping themselves accountable of policing themselves of working you know toward making their profession better so that they they are protecting themselves not by by shielding themselves from criticism but by being open to it and by reflecting and by taking action based on that I, I agree with you 100 percent on that um, my question is I guess to you and, and to everyone ho hopefully who will be listening to this afterwards is you know how do you form a standard that is based on a state test? It, it seems so difficult. I mean, that can be a component of it, but to make it such a large component of your overall sort of grade uh, that you're being given as a teacher seems so difficult for me when, you know, unless it would be very different if you were following the same set of, of students throughout, 
you know, throughout the, from K, you know, from kindergarten through 12th grade or something. And then you could certainly see how did this person develop, you know, how were you able to work with them. But when you're, it's like a spec. It's, it's, it's just a, you know, I teach 7th grade. You know, they're coming through. I, I hopefully can do a, a good job with some of them and, and others I'm not going to do a great job. Others are going to do fantastic. And, but can I be judged on that, on that small little piece of, uh, you know, a uh, speck in time. Uh, it's so hard yeah, it's for a, me. it's a limited data point. Isn't yeah. It? I mean, you know, it's funny. I, I, I've thought of this quite a bit. I have diabetes. I think this is a decent analogy. Um, okay. And with di- I, have, I have type 1 diabetes. And, okay. I, you know, I've had it for, for my whole life. And you test your blood sugar. Um, and you're supposed to test it, you know, four or five times a day. Uh, and it's helpful, obviously, if you, if you do that. But it, it is such a speck, and I always used to get frustrated going to the doctors. They say, well, how are your blood sugars in the mornings? Or how is it here? And I'd say, well, on that one day, given all the thousands of others of, th- of things that happened, like I ran five miles, which of course wasn't true, but if I had run five miles or if I had had a big breakfast or had gotten stressed or, you know, there's a lot of different variables. And, and now there's a new machine which tests your blood sugar every five minutes. And it's inter- it's like like internal, so it gives you the context of where the blood sugar has been, so that you know if it's a hundred now, if it was five hundred, you know, a half hour ago, that's very different than being a hundred for twelve hours, you know. And and I guess I see that comparison in in looking at that that global map, where like you said, like there's just a pinpoint. Uh, if we're using a, a statewide assessment, there's a one day one grade pinpoint in one exam and and I don't know if that if that can that can give people justice given the exams that they are if they're a different type of exam I, I might be more you know comfortable what, what do you yeah, think what are your thoughts know, on that I don't know too many people who think the exams as they are are absolutely perfect mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't I don't know uh, of anybody who, who uh, believes that um, and, and also something that uh, that you didn't mention is you said seventh grade, and I think how kind of tumultuous uh, that year is. And so there are so many factors that can affect uh, academic progress uh, in in seventh grade that uh, don't pop up in first grade or twelfth grade. Right. Uh, you know, and that could uh, have a huge effect on somebody's performance that year, which in the end. Uh, comes back to you, uh, whether whether it's fair or not. Sure. Uh, so uh, you know there are lots of lots of factors that go into it. Uh, the thing that I like about it is that it's a step in the right direction. Yeah. And you know that's and I, I feel the same way about No Child Left Behind too. A lot of flaws, a lot of kinks to work out, some spectacular failures in it as well. Uh, but uh, it's, it's pointing us in the right direction in certain ways. Uh, so whereas uh, tying a ton of, uh, I, I don't know exactly how you put it, putting a lot of weight into, into tests, for example, a lot of the different value-added solutions, uh, they're not perfect for a host of reasons that depend on the, you know, schools and communities, too. Um, I like the way they're thinking. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that's hugely important because how long has it been uh, where we have no uh, gauge of student progress? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, absolutely not. Uh, where it goes back to uh, teacher performance, and you know, it goes in the two directions. Directions, I'd say. There are teachers who do a remarkable job and make incredible progress, and you know, I saw that from being in school uh, to seeing it now. Yeah. You know, it just, you see it from every possible angle. And uh, there is no way to identify them other than them having put in a 25-year career where everybody realizes they're great. Mm-hmm. I, there are a lot of stinkers out there, too. There uh, are a lot of teachers who suck badly. They're terrible. No question. And, and, my, <laughs> and my, my biggest thought... On that is that if unions, like you're saying, were policing themselves 
And, you know, giving that like three step plan of identifying people who are struggling, giving them all the professional development they can give to, to try to help them improve on their areas of weakness. And then if they still don't make it and if they're still not doing what they need to do, you cut them loose. I mean, I, I don't, you know, I, I don't understand. I remember my first year teaching where I, I, I basically said, I, I, you know, it's, it's hard for me to fully grasp the notion of tenure. You know, I'll say it. I'll say it flat out. Uh, I'm, I'm saying it on the recording. It'll be on our first, you know, tape, assuming this thing doesn't blow up as the last one did. Um, it, you know, I think it's, it's important that people are held accountable. I mean, just like in any other job. Um, I think there are differences in education, though. Uh, not vast, huge differences, but like in nursing, it would be the same thing. You know, you know there, there are certain undefinable qualities in a nurse that, you know, the way they care, the way they talk to you, the way they, you know, go above and beyond. And, 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 and the same is true of teachers. And that, it's hard to quantify that, you know. Yes. It is. That's but, not to um, say we shouldn't try, you know. Right, you do the best you can with the measures that you've got, and you, you continuously try to try to improve those measures to get better ones. Uh, but, uh, you know, thinking about uh, the tenure system in most schools in New York, uh, what is it? You put two, three years in, mm -hmm. and uh, you, then there's uh, an up or down school board vote, which is probably based on uh, about 17 seconds of evaluation that happened uh, a year not, ago. Not quite, not quite. Okay. So Our, ours is a little more rigorous than that, but it's, but yes, you, it, I'm a big, you know what I'm saying, though. yeah, no, comparatively for three years, you're not, you're not yeah. being watched I'll be, half the I'll time. I'll be really generous and say that uh, the observations, did you ever get a surprise observation that was part of your record? Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. You were, you were, uh, always, or, uh, sorry, you weren't always notified of, observation in advance definitely no i still have i still have my assistant principal i've been teaching for 10 years i just started the new program this year and my assistant principal my principal uh because it is this pilot program for computers and everything they'll just bop in and sit down for you know 10 or 15 minutes and watch what's going on and see um is that an official evaluation i don't think so but i think they're they are doing an evaluate i mean they are evaluating the program to see how it's well, working that's that's them doing a job Absolutely. Uh, you know, yeah. that should be standard fare, uh, which, you know, it's great that, that your administrators are doing it. Uh, you know, it's not happening elsewhere. But, uh, you know, I wish I could think of the language in the, in the contract. Most of the time, uh, you get a heads up on, on evaluations. Well, there's uh, usually... The, ones, the official ones before the tenure process, uh, you go through that. I think it depends on the, um, on the, uh, on the contract within the, within the district. So I'm pretty sure, I don't, remember, I don't know the exact number or language, but I believe it was an equal number of announced and unannounced visits for me, like in the first three years. And then, then after, once you got tenure, then it's like, whatever it was, like one or two, two, two announced visits a year, you know? So yeah, I mean, to me, you're pretty, oops, you're pretty, you're pretty weak if you can't uh, do well during an announced visit when, when somebody's coming in. Uh, yeah. Other than the fact that somebody can see how you manage the classroom and, and and what kind of you know what kind of vibe you have with the students and stuff like that. Yeah, there are those useful uh, little things to pull out. Right. Well, I guess you know I guess in my in terms of state assessments and I guess this this leads into the politics because this is how how can we as a society with taxpayers and and parents and and just people who want our, our students to do well in school. How do we how do we best judge teachers and their and administrators and their ability to do that? And well, I guess I guess I I think a better test would be a better assessment. And you know I I guess I'm very Mr. Like alternative testing, Mr. Like you know for social studies write a play if you you know to show your demonstrate your learning, create a project, do something with the art. And it would be difficult to judge that. And the bottom line is it would cost a lot of money. Um, yes. Sadly, but, but to me, I don't know, my attitude is put your money where your mouth is. I mean, you know, this, the, the, the standard assessments that we have now 
uh, are not doing anybody an in, uh, uh, they're doing everybody an injustice because I mean it, like for history for example so much of it is memorization and we now have a world where you know look we're talking on computer I mean we could look up any information in the world we could speak into our smartphone and it could give us half the answers on the test in a matter of uh, you know, 1.94 seconds or whatever the Google uh, search result is. Um, and that's not what we need to prepare our kids for in the 21st century. We need to, we need, in my opinion, we, we need to allow them, teach them the skills to be able to access the information and then provide them with opportunities to be creative enough and passionate enough to take that information and produce understanding and really get at the true deep understanding of what's going on in war, what's going on in the economics, what's going on in, you know, the debate we're having right now, you know. Uh, the information yeah. is easy, but that's what we test, you know, the, the data. And, and that, that bothers me. Well, you know, there's one test that teachers never seem to, to complain about, um, which is a little, a little surprising. And uh, that's uh, that's New York's teacher certification test. I've never heard uh, anybody say uh, that uh, there's a massive problem there, which I'm not too surprised because just about everybody passes it. Yeah. If you show up with uh, if you show up with a heartbeat, you've got a really good chance of making it. Yeah. Uh, if, if you show up dead, they just might revive you. So <laughs> it's uh, like the driver's uh, test. You know, actually, uh, I, I think more people fail the driving exam uh, than the state certification exam, and that's not uh, that's not a joke. Yeah. Um, you know, I've seen uh, data from from colleges, uh, let's say tier three schools, if if uh, we were ranking them as U.S. News does, uh, where 100 percent of students uh, pass the exam. Well, I'm sure they have a good education program. Uh, but uh, it's quite rare to have uh, right. 100% of your students uh, reach that. But I've never heard uh, the union or a group of teachers say, come on, guys, let's raise this bar. Yeah. Uh, you know, I have heard them say, we should be paid a whole lot more. Uh, we should get more benefits. We should have more respect. We should be treated as professionals. Yet they never argue for uh, all of the things that will get them more professional respect, for example. I hear what you're saying. I mean, I, I agree. I agree with some of what you're saying. I disagree with others. I mean, I agree with you. You, ha you don't hear a lot of "oh, let's make the entrance exam harder," um, yeah. and and I do remember making fun of the exam. You know, like the choices were. You know, I just will never forget. It was like, you know, basically, if you know, if little Johnny is disrupting in class, you know, do you throw a dart at his forehead? You know, <laughs> scream across the room. And, you know, tell them to sit down and shut up or gently walk over and put your hand as a nonverbal sign to get them to be quiet. It was so, you know, it was so obvious that, you know, you, you, it, would, it would be pretty difficult to... Uh, it's very tough to fail. To I fail. A significant percentage of the people who do fail, uh, you know, have the flu or the worst day of their lives right. or, you know, disqualified on a section or something. Right. Uh, so, you know, if, if we want to talk about accountability and uh, raising the bar and increasing respect and professionalism. Why aren't we hearing about it from teachers about things like teacher training programs, uh, about uh, certification processes? I'd love that. I'd love to hear it, and I think everybody else would too. Well, I don't know if you're not. I mean, I don't know if you're not completely. I mean, you know, in my school, I do hear a lot about professional development and people wanting to you know, take courses and wanting to, to, to learn more and to be, you know, if we're asked to do something, we say, great, let's get the, the professional development so that we know we're doing it right. Um, we talk, you know, every year. So everybody's got a job already. Right. Everybody's been hired there. Right. But if something new is brought in, if there's some new, you know, at focus or new aspect that, um, you know, people are asked to do that they haven't been asked to done before or to do before, um, I think you know it's it's legitimate to to ask or for the for the faculty to ask for professional development to seek to professional development which they do sure. so you know I, I think in my school I mean I don't have a, a broad experience 
I've taught in one school for uh, for 10 years. Uh, it's a pretty, you know, high-performing school in Long Island. Um, but I, I, I just, I don't know. I, I do, I do see people uh, making the effort. I definitely agree with you that you know, there's certainly people that live on Easy Street. There's certainly people that you know, it's pretty easy to pass the test, and, and there's not a big clamoring for uh, for people uh, to to change that test to make it more difficult. Um, but I'm not sure if there's that in any profession um, in, in terms of, you know, even for doctors or for lawyers or, or, or for anybody. But, but, but I, I would agree with you on that. Um, uh, well, uh, I think the legal profession would probably have, uh, they would raise an issue if 97% uh, of people pass the bar. And, uh, you know, actually they have raised an issue because, uh, you know, if, when you look at uh, the rankings on law schools or uh, look at uh, reciprocity, things like that, uh, you know, they judge a law school by who passes the bar in New York and who passes it in California, you know, one or two other states. Um, because those, those weaker uh, states where the bar passage rate is so high because the bar is so much easier, uh, they, they don't matter as much. Uh, they've kind of... Uh, uh, and I, I don't want to say uh, maybe irrelevant, uh, but, you know, there's a reason why we look at the New York and California bar exams, because they're tough tests. They really mean something. Yeah, but isn't that, I mean, isn't that for the, uh, that's for the, the, the laws in New York? So, I mean, <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, you, you, can't, you can't look at the laws in Ohio and say, well... You know, we're taking the bar in, in New York, and uh, you know what I mean. What I'm saying is that, for example, if you if you take Harvard, which is in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. not New York, California, uh, and look at the percentage of uh, students who pass the bar, graduate from Harvard, oh, and then pass you. the bar in New York and California, compare okay. that to uh, you know Penn State law or something like that, uh, it, it'll show a, a difference in preparedness. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, because that's a, a real solid, hard measure. And if, uh, you know, 97% were passing every bar in all 50 states, then we probably wouldn't care. Uh, and but, I, I have a feeling that the professional organizations, like the ABA, would be uh, pushing to come up with, with some sort of test that mattered. Yeah, you know what? There's another aspect to this that I'm not, I don't know if you're considering. You know, what? I'm gonna take like a little station break here and just introduce the show, just because I am taping it. And uh, this is the Power of Ten, and it's called uh, Discussing Education's Future. And we air every Wednesday night at eight Eastern Time. And I have Matthew Tabor, is it or Tabor? Yeah, that's right. Tabor. Tabor. Uh, joining me from California, and he is interested in uh, talking about uh, politics and education. He is starting a new organization or trying to turn around a new organization. Uh, real, not completely new, but he has, I guess, recently started with the organization EducationNews.org. And uh, I'm speaking to him about uh, the tenure process, assessment, uh, and how you know states are mandating different things from from education uh, from educators. And we're talking about how uh, unions have been. Uh, not necessarily coming to the forefront enough, uh, in, in really in both of our estimations, in terms of what they can do to sort of uh, make their profession look better. Uh, on the other hand, one, one thing I, I would say, and I think it's important for us to keep in mind, I mean, you're talking about how easy the, the, the exam is, and I think it is pretty easy uh, to become a teacher. Um, but the the, and, and you said how the you know the the bar exams are much more difficult and the, and they and they high, held, hold t people to a higher standard. That's a shame for me. Um, but there's a reality that we're not talking about, like a white elephant in the room that we're not talking about. Because yes, the educational standards for teachers should be higher. There's no question. The educational standards for kids should be higher. I think there's no question. Um, but I think in order to attract people into the profession that will be able to, uh, that will be able to accomplish those tasks, you're going to have to pay them more because they're going to be in other fields where they're getting more money. I mean, ed luckily, education, like the example I gave before, nursing and, and, and doctors to some extent, uh, they go into it for the love of the cause. And, and they, 
they certainly don't go into it for the money. I mean, education is not a money gig. Um, I graduated again, you know, in Long Island. Um, most of my friends are making many, many times what, what I make, uh, graduating from similar uh, colleges, and I could have chosen that path, and I didn't. And a few of them have even gone into retirement for a few years where they, you know, have been out of work, but yet they're still doing very, very well for themselves, and they'll continue to do well. And I don't necessarily begrudge them that, but I do wonder if um, if educators, you know, if there should be like a simultaneous process of, you know, the, certainly the standards can come up for educators, but the pay should come up too, you know. And as, and as as the standards come up, and as the assessment is more uh, is judged based on how well they're doing, they should be paid more. I don't I don't have a problem with that. Um, my my fear and my you know is is merit based pay because it's like well who's judging the merit you know what you say is merit may be very different between uh, what I say is merit you know. Uh, yeah. And it, 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 it's, a, it's a really tough one. Uh, well, I can tell one thing that would uh, really bolster the case for more pay. And that is having uh, teachers not come from the very bottom of academic achievement. Mm -hmm. uh, now, if, uh, for example, everybody likes to look at Finland. Uh, one thing that Finland does quite well, in addition to how they do teacher prep, is uh, they select uh, the very best students. Uh, to uh, to go into uh, the teaching profession, and uh, you know they they also uh, you know I, I don't want to say uh, look at uh, personalities uh, you know but they they take into account uh, all of those intangibles that we know the great teachers have, uh, but uh, they they also focus on academic quality, and that is not something that we see in the United States even at the very best the schools like uh, you could say Columbia uh, Teachers College or uh, the people at Harvard uh, Graduate School of Education um, these are top-notch institutions uh, but uh, the academic requirements uh, to get into those programs pale in comparison to what you need to uh, get into other academic programs at the same school but don't now, you feel that's because the end result is you're going to get paid more, so more people want it, more people strive to get into those those other departments. I mean, certainly someone that's going to get an MBA from Harvard is going to make zillions times more over the course of a lifetime than than an educator, even if they're the superintendent of schools. Well, we could talk about some of the superintendents pay down in your region. Oh, I, I, absolutely! No, I, I'll, I'm happy to. I'm happy to defend the superintendent's pay. I'm one of the few people that I, I have no problem defending that. I mean, they are, you know, they're the CEOs of, of the education at schools that are doing phenomenally well, and they're paid phenomenally well. Sure, but if we're going to uh, talk about the marketability of a degree, uh, one of the most popular majors uh, in the United States is psychology, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you're going to have a real hard time showing me that psychology majors are pulling down 150000 a year. They aren't. Uh, they have really mediocre salaries uh, for, uh, you know, when you consider related to other majors, you know, electrical engineering or something like that. Engineers uh, blow psychology out of the water. Yet lots of people are studying psychology. So there are tons of examples uh, that run counter to uh, you know, the, the idea that uh, people are money motivated. Uh, they, they, they simply aren't. And there's no real evidence that uh, raising the pay uh, will significantly improve the academic quality of applicants. And I, even if it was there. I'm uh, not, I, I, I find that very hard to believe. I find that very, then why, then why well, does any... You, I can list you 10 departments and 10 majors that have zero marketability. No, no, but, but you know, what, no, so, no, but why do you think, I mean, I mean, the reason that there are, we have Heather Peretz has joined us, uh, Math, Matthew, this is Heather. Uh, I, I, can you see me? I can't see you. Yep, we can see you. I uh, totally cannot see you. Well, I'm sorry. That's okay. We, I can just hear you. So I will listen. 
Okay, well, just know that you're on, and there's a hi, Adam, in the background. When you're when you're speaking, you are uh, being seen, so just, just so you know. Or now you're not. <laughs> I think she okay. left. Um, but, Heather, just to get to get you into the conversation, we've, we've been talking about a little bit of politics, a little bit of uh, state assessments, and um, how are unions able to sort of better police themselves and better protect themselves uh, to be able to justify um, maybe a higher, a higher salary, uh, more respect within the educational institutions uh, that we have, you know, in America. And, what, you know, the discussion we were just having right now is um, would higher salary, salaries necessarily attract a better caliber, caliber teacher? <coughs> I don't necessarily think so. I mean, someone that's skilled at something that isn't necessarily good at delivering their knowledge to others. So that's just my two cents. But do you think of that, the average salary, uh, I don't know what the average salary is right now for educators across the nation, it's maybe 50 grand or something. Um, it's a bit closer to 60. Is it? So say it's $60,000 60, is the average salary for educators in the nation. Say that suddenly become, that average suddenly becomes 180. You don't think there's going to be a, a, a better teacher applicant than there, than there was previously? I think with something like that, if you offered me 150000 tomorrow, told me that uh, I would, uh, it would be impossible to fire me no matter how poorly I performed, that I would have a lifetime job uh, after 24 months of towing the line, if I had job security that uh, was not rivaled anywhere else, that I worked on the academic calendar. Uh, which is pretty sweet. I've done it before. I like it a lot better than the calendar I have now. Uh, then absolutely, 150000 would would lure me into teaching at a public school. Yeah. Do you really think that that's the case, that you, that you have absolute freedom and that you have absolute job security and you can never lose, lose your job and that you never have the ability to... Um, be judged or criticized or, or anything else. I mean, do you, do you really think it's that much of a cakewalk that you can just kind of kick back, put your feet up on the uh, on the desk, and sit back and, and 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 not do too much work? Well, I, I'm obviously reducing it for the, the sake of uh, convenience, uh, you know, presenting. But do I think uh, do I think it's the same as many other professions? Absolutely not. And we see, for example, in New Jersey. Uh, we see how difficult it is to fire teachers who absolutely should be dismissed. But but uh, but, but let's separate the two issues for a second. You, I mean, you said yeah. two different things. You talked about being able to fire someone, but then you also seem to indicate that it was basically like the easiest job in the world, and you could be drooling and and you know get through the year. I mean, do you, do you think that educating you know a group of students that you know having a hundred a hundred 25, 150 students uh, every day that you're that you're responsible for, um, for not just their learning but their behavior and their whether they got something to eat that morning and whether the parents are beating them or whether they're not getting invited to parties or they're doing drugs and all that stuff. I mean, do you think that's an easy job? Uh, no, but that's a completely separate issue than whether you can perform poorly and keep your job. Oh, I agree. No, I just yeah. wanted to separate them for a second. Yeah, no, no, totally. No, I agree with you. I just just wanted to, you know, keep them separate. Yeah, it's, you know, it's funny. The very first time, uh, literally the first day, this was a long time ago, that I, you know, I signed up to be a substitute teacher in the neighborhood I moved to. And uh, the very first day, I was up all night working on something. And I still couldn't sleep for whatever reason. And... Uh, I uh, ended up taking, uh, you know, Tylenol PM or something that, like that. Uh, finally get to sleep at, you know, 5 in the morning. Well, about 5.30, I finally get the call from this district that they've got uh, a, a sub option. And I had to take it because I know that if I don't, uh, uh, you know, if I don't take the first opportunity, I'm unlikely to get a second call. Right, right. Um, and, uh, boy, was that a tough day. <laughs> <laughs> when, I, when I was working on uh, about six seconds of sleep and, uh, uh, 
it was it was tough um, on top of, of uh, you know what's what's difficult about the day uh, it's a tremendous uh, takes a tremendous amount of energy uh, just to do the basics uh, when you're dealing with with as many kids as, as you mentioned uh, as many uh, class periods, depending on what schedule a school is using. Sure. And if you want to keep an eye out for all those uh, other, you know, non-academic uh, things that matter so much, um, it's really, really tough. Uh, but uh, the truth is, is you can drop the ball on a lot of that and still remain a teacher. Right. Uh, and that's uh, uh, that's kind of a tragic thing. To me. Do you, do you, it's very hard to be a great teacher. Very easy to be a bad one <laughs> and get away with it. Well, do you think that's true? I mean, do you think that's true at other at other jobs, like like being a being a, I don't know, a, a waiter or or a nurse or a doctor or a dentist or a, or you know a, a flight engineer or an, or a regular engineer or a lawyer? I mean, you know, I feel like as I've gotten older, I used to have this. Uh, sort of high and mighty ideal that you know. Wow, you're a lawyer. You must be really smart. And as I uh, as I as I grew up, I, I think I realized, wow, this person's not really really smart. It's just that maybe they had the money to go to law school and get the degree uh, because they don't seem all that smart. Or you know, this engineer. Uh, you know, yeah, they're doing what they're doing, but they, they don't seem all that brilliant. Or or this this public servant or someone that works for the, you know, for the public works department or something, uh, you know, they're doing okay. Uh, but I don't know. I, I I don't I don't know if education is the is the only field like that. And and I guess if you do think it is, um, what what can we do? Or what would you do if you were suddenly the you know Obama's right hand man for education? Secretary of Education, what would you do? Um, the first thing I'd do is open up the discussion, and I'd admit that there is something to discuss, mm -hmm. uh, which unfortunately I think is, is the next step that we have to take. We're so, we're so far away from fixing a lot of these problems. Uh, it would be a huge step just to start talking about them. Right. And, you know, you talk about some of the other uh, professions. Um, you know, if, if a lawyer lost every case... Uh, it might hurt business. If uh, every surgeon, uh, you know, sliced an artery, fewer people would be on his table. Uh, if every waiter, uh, you know, dropped a meal in your lap, uh, he would probably be out at the, at the end of the night. Yet, uh, you know, I'm thinking of, uh, of a teacher that I had direct experience with, great guy, and very committed to his profession. Uh, he taught an AP class that over uh, over a period of at least 10 years, uh, and I'm saying 10 because I can't go back uh, before that with certainty, he had, uh, he had something like two or three uh, get a three on the AP exam. Never a four, never a five, and all the rest ones and twos. Yeah. Uh, that is, uh, it's not stellar, is it? Uh -huh. uh, but he wasn't going anywhere. Nobody else took what, Why do you think that is? Which part? That he wasn't going anywhere. Um, he was in a subject that uh, it was, wasn't as easy to transfer anybody into. It was a little bit specialized. Uh, but at the same time, it wouldn't have been really possible uh, to, uh, to dismiss him in any way. Well, were there any, was there anybody making any effort to make help him to make changes so that things would improve? Uh, yeah, I mean, there was less support at the time uh, with the uh, DP institutes than than there is now, for example. Uh, but at the same time, he was, excuse me, a veteran of uh, teaching. He knew his subject matter quite well. Uh, he wasn't performing. Uh, but uh, let's say. Let's say every resource in the world was given to him, uh, and it still didn't work. Uh, you got to kick him out. You got to kick him out. I mean, that's where that's administrators cannot, and, and kick him out where and kick, do what? Get get rid of him. Fire him. That's where you bring. That's where as a, as administrator. Now there's there's two there's two sides to this. There's the unions right that need to be more. 
uh, stringent in their both the requirements for the entrance to their profession and for policing those teachers and giving the teachers the tools that they need to uh, to succeed and doing everything they can. But then there's the other part. It's like the, what we're facing now, which is clearly not working at all with the debt ceiling. You know, we have divided government. It's supposed to work. You're supposed to compromise. So there should be that other side. There should be that administrative side that says, listen, last year you got written up because everyone's getting a one on your exam. You took this professional development and it didn't work. We need to see something from you next year. You've written it in your file. You, it, it, you know, if we don't see something from you next year, you're going to get one more chance for professional development. You're going to move on. We're either going to have to change you to a different subject you can teach better. And if we do that and it still doesn't work out, we're going to have to let you go. Yeah, but administrators can't. They can, absolutely can. They absolutely well, can. There's a lot that goes into it. Well, there's a paper trail. To say that there's a lot that goes into it is the understatement of the century. Uh, for no, example. But you're not uh, you're not giving the I, I don't know if that's necessarily true. You need to you need to hold just like you need to hold teachers accountable, and I would agree to that hundred percent. You do. You need to hold administrators equally accountable because they're the ones who are supposed to be. Just like if a see if the guy that spilled all the the waiter spills all the food on the on the people, and then the boss says, oh, oh, well, what are we going to do? Well, then it's his fault that the guy wasn't fired. It's the administration's fault if they don't the get in. What's that? The administration has very little power in most cases uh, to actually be administrators, which I feel quite badly that they can't uh, do their jobs very well. But what are you basing that on? Um... I, I, I'm not sure exactly what you want me to what you want me to say here. I mean, it's. Uh, well, well, what, I, I guess know, well, because what I want to say is fact. Uh, you know, if you look at, uh, for example, a, a big case in New Jersey, uh, where uh, a teacher was uh, a very heavy drug user, uh, he had physically uh, abused students. Um, physically, not sexually. Uh, he was terrible as a teacher, whatever. It took uh, $400,000 and four years uh, to get rid of him. Right. He is an example, a, a really egregious example. You know, the guy I mentioned, great guy, uh, <laughs> in, in just about every way. He just had really limited success uh, with, with the course. Um, you know, we're talking somebody who is a disgrace, and it takes that many years and that much money uh, to to go through what should be a routine dismissal. Well, there's no, there's no question that, uh, sadly, and I, and I agree with you, sadly, the where we are in society today, there virtually are no routine dismissals. It's just that in the real corporate world, these routine dismissals, people know that the corporations have endless money and that they're going to win, whereas it's sort of on the flip side, whereas the, the person being fired in, in the teaching realm can know, well, if I push this far enough, the, the, the public education, the government's not going to want to go that far, whereas corporations can flex their financial muscles and say, this is a joke, that we, we can destroy this, this person with our corporate wealth so they have no chance of even fighting it in court. I, 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 I agree with you, and I do, yes, there's no question. It's not easy. I'm not saying, oh, well, why don't the administrators just fire them all? Because certainly there are, um, you know, next steps, and often they involve the, the legal procedure and, and thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars in, well, in legal I, I want to go through the process uh, kind of step by step here because, you, you know, you ask where am, I, where am I getting this. Let's talk about Chicago. Uh, let's say that, that uh, an administrator or principal has reason to question your performance, uh, starting to think about dismissal. You might be a candidate uh, because for whatever reason, you stink at your job. Uh, there's up to a year of remediation, which touches on what Heather said, uh, providing all the supports, the mentoring, um, you know, all of those options to see if we can identify the problem and fix it, because that's ideal. So there's a year. Let's say it doesn't work. Uh, then 
uh, there's uh, a big period before any sort of hearing happens uh, with lots of advance notice. Uh, both sides have to, you know, kind of go through the due process angle uh, or the, the prep before the due process. That takes maybe four, uh, four months, three, four months. Then you actually have the hearing, uh, which is uh, part of the contract. Uh, that hearing is spread out for so long, uh, it takes about six months, okay? And then depending on what happens with that hearing, uh, the appeals process, which depending on the state, there can be several rounds of appeals, we're looking at another two years, another three years. Right. Now, that means, that means to dismiss even someone who is a disgrace to the profession and community can take up to five years uh, to do that. The same is true? Same time you're pay, at the same time, you're paying the lawyers, you're paying uh, everybody on both sides, you're paying the teacher uh, to go through uh, everything. The costs of uh, the mentoring, the remediation, all of the supports that go into the process. And uh, there's also uh, the retirement and buyout option that can kick in at any time. But don't, see, I guess I see a lot of similarities to a lot of other industries with this, the same thing. I mean, you, you fire someone from you know, a, a trading firm and based on poor performance – and they can say, well, you got to prove it. What are you talking about? I made millions of dollars for the firm last year. You fire a lawyer who's a partner, similar thing. Once you're a partner in a law firm, it's very difficult to get rid of somebody. How do they judge? And if they do judge that you're no longer doing your job, you can then bring it to litigation. Regular, you know, a regular crime. Somebody commits a murder or, or, or steals a car or whatever. It doesn't happen overnight. These things take time. And I'm not saying that it's great. I'm not saying that that's good that it takes time. I'm not saying that, you know, but I think there's a balance. There needs to be a balance because I hear you. If every, if you, if it takes you nine years and a million dollars to get rid of every bad teacher, then that's a big problem. But is that the problem of the educational system or is that the problem with the legal system? You know, is it something that the government can do? And this is, this is where the politics come in. Is there These a way? Contracts. This isn't the legal system. This is what's in your contract, the one that your school district has. Well, but but this but this certainly has to do with 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 a legal document. It is the legal system because you're you're dealing with a contract and you're dealing with a violation of a contract. Conceivably, if you're if you're terminating a, a, an individual, so I I think what you know one of the things that we need to look at is one how to expedite that process, how to make it as fair as can be, and how to make it so that we can do so on a, a not a regular basis, but on a need, as needed basis. Where if there are people who are falling down, and if we've gone through the right channels of documenting that and giving them giving them the chances for professional development, like you're saying, the union should be you know seeking this out to try to better teachers because hopefully no union wants to have teachers that aren't at their best, the best they possibly can be. And if that still isn't good enough, then I believe. You know, get rid of them. You know, if the inherent problem is, well, getting rid of them is going to take too long, is the answer destroy the unions? I mean, I, I don't think so. Well, that, that's not at all what I was suggesting. But no, I, I, I know. I'm just... A situation, a key difference in the situation that you posed mm -hmm. uh, and the one that I went through describing the process in Chicago, which, you know, made its rounds months ago online. Right. Um, is that uh, in the Chicago example, it takes that long to make the dismissal. In the example uh, you gave, uh, somebody might have recourse uh, if they were wrongly fired. We see that all the time. But there's not a three or four or five year process before they even get fired. Now, there's, they can bring a suit and uh, appeal any decision after firing has already taken place, and if they were dismissed wrongly, then the employer would have to, uh, you know, uh, hire them back, do back pay, all sorts of restitution like that. But there is no three, four, five-year uh, process in the private sector before you can actually dismiss someone. So, you've reached your breaking point. Your kids are wearing you down, and you need a little adult time now. Don't want to call that babysitter and shell out another 80 bucks that you can't afford? Enter babysittingbarter.com and never pay for a babysitter again. 
Start an online village with your friends whom you trust to watch your children. Here's how it works. Each village member starts with 30 points. When you need a sitter, simply pick the date and time. With one click, send a request to your entire village. You don't pay in money, but in points. One child for three hours equals three points. Two children for three hours would be six points. As you pay, your points go down, and all you have to do is watch one of your friend's kids and your points go back up. Let's revolutionize the way we do babysitting, and let's do it together. The site is free, and so is the babysitting. So what are you waiting for? Join babysittingbarter.com today, where you trade your time but keep your money and your sanity. So we're back there after that commercial break with, uh, <laughs> with Matthew uh, Tabor and Heather Peretz, and we're talking about politics and education. And it, what it's boiled down to in this conversation is the, I, I guess, the difference or the, the, the ability for, for unions to, to work with their, uh, their employees that are not meet, meeting up up to the standards that uh, all educators and hopefully children, administrators, politicians, parents, everybody uh, wants the educators to meet up to. And we, we've kind of gone through uh, a, a series of ideas about, you know, the unions coming forth and, and, and creating a better entrance exam and demanding more, uh, the talk about maybe higher pay if the services do uh, improve. And then the question of tenure, uh, the question of is this something unique to education? Is this something where um, if someone is doing a horrible job, why does it take so long to fire them, to go through this legal process uh, as per the contract uh, and to fight it out? And um, Matthew has been uh, pretty much arguing, you know, and talking about how that this just doesn't happen in, in other industries. And, you know, I, I, it sounds like from from your remarks that you feel that this is hurting education because of this log jam. Is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah. And uh, a lot of districts, uh, especially ones that, well, now just about everybody's real tight on finances. Uh, but uh, let's say you're a small district, uh, like some of the rural districts in upstate New York, uh, that uh, you know might have. Uh, grades 6 or 12 in one building, uh, very small. Um, if they look at the, uh, the prospect of three, four, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000 to dismiss a teacher, uh, they have to think about whether they can swing that uh, financially. And they shouldn't have to be in a choice or be put in a position to make a choice like that where yeah. they're saying, you know what, let's let's lay off on this teacher for another year, another two years, maybe through that teacher's career, get them to leave on their own accord or something like that. Because we simply, you know, think of all the things we would have to cut if we were to absorb another 100000 or more in legal fees. And, you know, originally uh, the unions fought for protection for a ton of different reasons. Really simple things like uh, making sure that a woman wouldn't be fired when she, was, when she became pregnant. Uh, all sorts of really excellent protections for employees. Uh, that's a, a hell of a far cry from the situation we're in now, which is you can be demonstrably awful at your job, and because it's going to cost up to half a million dollars to buy you out or get rid of you over a period of several years, I, then we have to put up with you. Yeah, I... I... I, again, I, I hear what you're saying. I, I'm not sure I, I 100% agree with you. I mean, I, I do. See, we, we've had a similar instance in our town, actually, not with uh, with education, but with a business. And okay. basically, the business owner in our town. We have a town of of about 5,000 people. Heather lives in the same town, and oh, okay. the business owner actually uh, makes far more than the annual operating budget of the town for the entire year. So okay. what has transpired over the course of 20 years or ten, last 10 years or so, and I, I don't want to get into the details and, and get sued myself, uh, <laughs> is that uh, the, 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 the business owner has continually or seemingly, allegedly, I shall say, broken the law and uh, has brought the, the, the village to court. 
and okay. it has been very difficult for the village uh, to maintain uh, the, the the legal fees that that it's taking to bring someone who is clearly or allegedly <laughs> breaking the law um, yeah. openly, um, and, and it has become a real issue. And like you're saying, you know, there there, there comes a point where you say, you know. Do we let this go? Do we stop? I mean, how, are we able to compete yeah. with this behemoth? And I guess my question, and I think this is what, where I'd like to end because we've been on for about an hour and I don't want to take up too much of your time, uh, is what sort of financial uh, changes can we make to, to make this process not as costly as it is? You know, for I mean, I'm you know can be a huge lefty for for healthcare. You know, for me, it's simple. You get rid of the health insurance companies. You don't make it profitable for them. You close out the free market in that sense, and okay. you make it a heck of a lot cheaper for everyone. In this case, you know, I've heard of like these vigilante lawyers coming around saying that in different towns, a bunch of lawyers lawyers will work together and donate their time for free to prosecute uh, or to defend the school in their decisions against uh, tenured teachers who are or maybe being dismissed. Um, but I, I think it's a big picture that faces education. Uh, and I think it gets to the heart. I really, Matthew, I think, you know, you've hit on a lot of what the average American does not like about our educational system and this feeling, whether it's, whether it's accurate or not, but there's absolutely the feeling that teaching is something that you can do forever, regardless of how well you do it. And once you've gotten tenure. Right, once you That's get right. tenure. And once you've gotten tenure, which is anything but a rigorous process in most places, right. and, award, and awarded very, very quickly. And I would agree with you that that's yeah. a big, big problem, that public perception. Whether yes. that perception is, yeah. is accurate in all cases, right. I would say it's not. But, in uh, all cases, no. But there is a there is a, a significant segment uh, where it rings true. Uh, to have it uh, to have it described purely as perception, uh, it simply can't stand. That's not the case. Uh, it's not um, you know it's it's not every teacher, and not every teacher is like in the movie Bad Teacher where they're doing crazy stuff and. Uh, you know, loving the uh, the academic schedule and, and skating by and in class hungover. It's not like that. Right. And no sensible person believes that it is. Uh, but there is absolutely no way that anybody can uh, stand there and, uh, and say that none of this is true. Because we can see district by district, over and over and over, from state to state, uh, how we have lax standards to enter the profession. We have incredibly low bars. Uh, we have an inability to police, monitor, uh, gauge, measure anything remotely analytical within the profession. And then we guarantee after a very short period of time uh, that someone will be there uh, until the end of time, even if they aren't all that good at what they do. So, you know, when you put all of this together, uh, it's absolutely but tenure following. doesn't guarantee a job forever. Tenure is your due process. Right, right. Uh, and when when we can see examples of uh, of the types of budget cuts that the NEA, for example, was warning against uh, the dismissals months ago, we've seen that those haven't come to pass. Uh, we've seen uh, we've seen hiring slow, uh, and we've seen some cuts. Uh, but we haven't seen, uh, you know, we haven't seen that apocalypse uh, in teacher jobs that was being advertised six months ago. Uh, relative to something like manufacturing, uh, I'd, I'd rather teach second grade uh, if I was looking for job security than pretty much do anything in Detroit. Well, yeah, I mean, teaching is a great job, not just for job security, but for the satisfaction that you get in, in watching kids develop. Right. My question, my, 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 my the point though, was, was that with all of those factors, uh, it, it's very difficult to kind of marginalize, uh, you know, the average person's or the public's uh, perception and say, well, you know, all of this is, you know, they really just think all these things. No, but I haven't said that. I mean, the whole hour I've been agreeing with you on a lot of your, your statements. I'm not poo-pooing you. 
and saying that this is all. No, I'm not. I'm not saying this. This is all just dreamt up by the public, mm -hmm. and that there's not bad teachers, and that it's easy to get rid of them, and that you know. I mean, I agree with you. The exam to get in is is a joke. But let let's just suppose, and and we'll and we'll end on this note. Let's suppose the standards for entrance into uh, the teaching profession are raised, right? Let's suppose that it's easier to get rid of teachers who have been offered professional development. Uh, the process doesn't take, take as long. It doesn't become as costly. And more teachers are targeted for dismissal as a result of, let's say, poor uh, performance on state assessments and maybe, uh, you know, a variety of other factors. Okay. And say a lot of teachers start losing their jobs. The pay stays okay. the same. Mm -hmm. Who is going to educate? Or how? Better, that's not the right way to frame the question. There's not how, going to be people that want to do the job anymore. Well, how yeah. are we going to attract a better educator? Is really the question that we're, that we're looking for, right? Because it's not. Let's not just say, we, you know, hey, we have to settle for crummy teachers because uh, you know there's no other way to do it. How can we? How can we best attract the best educator? What can we do? Uh, you know, there's there's little competition at the very beginning of the whole process, which is uh, that uh, teacher training program. Uh, we pump out so many teachers. Uh, we take uh, the supply and just obliterate any sort of demand that we have on it. For example, in New York, even on the administrator side, there's something like four to five times uh, certified administrators as actual administration jobs in the state of New York. Uh, we've got a problem with colleges and universities treating ed programs as cash cows uh, because it makes, it makes common sense. How much does it cost to do four years with an elementary ed major versus uh, uh, you know, high energy physics major? Uh, just the, the simple cost of, of running a department um, makes uh, teaching a really nice thing to have in your college or university. Um, so they have no incentive uh, to, uh, they want as many people as possible, is what I'm saying, in teaching programs uh, so they can uh, come out a little better on the bean counting. There's no incentive uh, to raise the bar for colleges and universities. And I think that's the very first step. Uh, you know, we have to get that bar raised at the beginning of the process. So how do you and, have to get the bar raised? Uh, am I in charge of every college and university uh, in the state of New York? Well, I'm asking, I mean, what, 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 <laughs> what, what, what incentives? What no, no, but what incentives could we offer maybe the colleges? If, that, if that's your... If that's your prognosis with the problem, uh, that it's you know it's a cash cow, it doesn't cost anything. I'm sure there's other majors that don't cost anything either. Um, yeah, sure. You know why? You know what? How can we narrow down or winnow down the number of educators if that even is the problem? Uh, we could make it an exclusive, an exclusive, highly selective uh, profession. And how do you and do that? Uh, one option would be uh, to eliminate a bachelor's level uh, education program and see that everybody goes through a four-year degree in some content area and then they go into education as a graduate component and that would give uh, that would give everybody better perspective uh, whether uh, it's uh, having a, an application process that's more rigorous so that uh, departments can get a better sense of, of teachers who come in Whereas the, the idea that somebody would be interviewed uh, to enter, uh, uh, let's say, SUNY Oneonta's uh, education program uh, as a high school senior, they're not getting it. Uh, so they have, Oneonta, for example, or any other SUNY has absolutely no idea if uh, some person has any of those intangibles that would make them a successful teacher. They probably have a better idea uh, after uh, four years of college and a more rigorous evaluation process. So that uh, could you make that case for the, any absolutely any profession on, on, with anything? Uh, most of them, yes. <laughs> most, yes. And isn't that the direction that we're going? That that uh, that a uh, mat uh, about well, I lost somebody. Oh, I'm still here. I'm still here. It says, awake check. Are you still here? 
that me? Maybe that's you. Well, I guess they're, or I'll show my face for a sec. Yes, I'm still here. Yeah, this thing doesn't bop around for me as well as it, it seems to for others. Um, yeah, I, I guess my question is, as we move, I mean, it seems to me that nowadays the, the college education is what, you know, 20 years ago was a high school education, and now a graduate level degree is what a college level degree was. So I feel like we are moving in that direction. Um, you know what? I, I'm going to close it out tonight. Um, Matthew, I really appreciate you joining us. Heather, I appreciate you joining us as well. Um, just to give a recap, uh, this is called The Power of Ten, although we have four tonight, or three tonight. Um, uh, it's called The Power of Ten, Discussing Education's Future. Tonight's topic has been politics and education. Um, next week will be uh, The Changing Face of Textbooks, and uh, we should have several guests who are going to be speaking on how we can change the way that we do business for homework and through textbooks. Uh, next week and please join us at 8 p.m. Eastern and feel free to uh, give me an email at manixlab at gmail.com and as always at the end of the show uh, I'd like to ask each one of you for a one sentence message in a bottle about politics and education if you're stranded on a desert island and you wanted to give your solution in one sentence or less to the, the rest of the community um, why don't we let uh, let Heather go first, and Matthew will finish up with you. Um, I don't know, Desert Island. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I just don't know. Um, I do think that there needs to be improvement in teacher education as well as, you know, teachers not being made the scapegoat for the administrative process that needs to occur in order to get rid of bad teachers. Okay. All right. Thank you. Matthew, what do you think? Message in a bottle. <coughs> oh, in that bottle, I would say uh, raise the bar and stop pretending like it's already high. <laughs> I think that's pretty legitimate. Um, Matthew, <laughs> it was really nice meeting you. It was really good to hear what you have to say. I think we have some differences on some issues, but I think we have a lot of, uh, you know, the same opinions on, on a lot of things. And I think it was certainly a good conversation. Uh, I hope we can continue it, and I hope uh, I wish you the best of luck with your, uh, with your newspaper. And uh, let's keep in touch. Sounds good. Well, Brian and Heather, it's been excellent uh, talking to you for a little bit, and I hope we can do it again. All right, great. Thanks a lot. So long, guys. Bye. Bye.